Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for loving us and uh, calling us to be your children. Thank you for your word and how we can learn it and uh, from, from your word understand a little bit better who you are and relate to you a little bit better. So Father, as we continue our, our series on, on how to study your word, uh, just open our eyes and allow us to understand what you have for us there and allow us to go through this process and, uh, and do it better so that we know you better. It was a great time this morning as we uh, study and as we fellowship and as we um, sing music, all of it worship to you. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, how to study the Bible. These are the four steps that we're using. Lesson one, the interpretive process. Lesson two, bridging the historical gap. That's what we're going to look at this week. Last week we looked at the interpretive process. Lesson three, bridging the literary gap. Lesson four, bridging the contextual gap. Because we're reading a document that was read that was written 2,000 to 3,500 years ago by 40 different, 40 or so different authors, there's a process. We don't live in that world. We don't live in that culture. We don't live in that time frame. We don't even have that language. We don't speak that language. So. There's a, there's a process that we have to go through, and, and that's what we're learning in this series. So this morning, we're going to bridge the historical gap. You're going to hear a lot of things that are very important for you to remember, and sometimes I know you frustrate with me because I talk a lot of history, and you'll understand a little bit better why when we go through this. Any questions before I get going? Lesson two, bridging the historical gap. Big two, bridging the historical gap. You see, lesson, lesson one, the interpretive process. Lesson two, bridging the historical gap. Go. Bridging the historical gap. That's the step that we must take in order to understand what the Bible means in the culture in which it was given. We talked last time about exegesis, bringing out of the text what is in the text, not eisegesis, reading into the text what our own thoughts are, what our own needs are. So easy to go the opposite direction. First step in doing exegesis is to understand the history and the culture. So we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into that here during this session, bridging the historical gap. Um, basic training, high level stuff. The Bible is more than 2,000 years old. Did you guys know that? <laughs> if you didn't, know it. The copyright date on your Bible on the inside, folks, is not correct for the real Bible. Uh, there is a historical and a cultural gap that must be bridged. Now, a few historical issues to consider, a few things that you have to take account of anytime you're reading the Bible, is who wrote the book, first thing. That's the author. Ask yourself that question. When was it written? Was it written during the Old Testament? Was it written during the New Testament? Was it written um, in, during the occupation of the Romans into Israel? Or was it written during the occupation of the Babylonians? Historical issues to consider. We, we do this every day. When you open an email, the first thing you know before you even open it is who is it, who, who wrote it, right? I mean, imagine reading all your emails and not caring about who actually is writing it. 
That would be silly because who writes it plays such an important role. Uh, then the date of the email. You know, who goes and says, hey, I want to read every email from 2006 that I've received. No one does that. You know, you want to read emails that are applying to you today. And so, so the date and the author are things that we naturally do in anything that we read. Uh, but for some reason, usually we don't care about that stuff when we read the Bible. Who was it written to? Um, as we talked about during the last session, we'll say once again, the Bible in a very real sense, must be seen as not being written to you. Okay, that's important to see at the beginning. It has application to you, yes, but it's not written to you. I've often heard it said that the Bible is God's love letter to you. Uh, not bad. Don't really mind that, but I get a little bit, you know, uh, uh, timid about using such language unless you heavily qualify it. Yes, God wants us to know about him. Yes, that's what the Bible is about. But it has a context. It has a history. We can't misunderstand that. Finally, the circumstances and the purpose, sometimes called the occasion. What was the occasion of the letter? Why was the letter written? Why did Paul write to the Galatians? Why, did the, why were the Psalms written? Why was First and Second Chronicles written? When have we already had First and Second Kings? Mm you got to ask those questions. Why was Matthew written whenever Mark was already written? Ask yourself those questions and you'll begin to have insight into how to interpret that particular book. A couple of avenues of historical research. We've got internal data and external data. Briefly, internal data is that which we can learn from the text itself. There's so much, folks. Don't don't be too scared at this point where you're saying, oh my gosh, we've got to learn the history. And, you know, I hated history in school and don't want to go back there. I'll just leave it up to my pastor and I'm not going to read my Bible anymore. I don't want you to go there. A lot of the Bible, you can discern and understand the history from the Bible itself. The narratives of the Bible tell a lot of the history. And, and so internal data is very important for understanding the history of the Bible. That's where you learn a lot of your history is from the Bible. And the internal might be Paul saying, this letter is to the people of Corinth. You're like, oh, okay, he told me who's, it, who's written to. And he says, from Paul. Oh, okay, I know who wrote it. And, and stuff like that, you know, in the book of Acts, we know that, hey, this is happening in this specific time. So within the Bible, internally, a lot of these questions are, are, are being answered. And we just need the ears and the eyes to be able to say, oh, okay, I'm getting the setting. I'm getting the environment here from within the Bible. The Paul in every one of his letters told that he was the one writing it. However, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do you know in none of those, do they ever name themselves? They never say they are the ones that wrote it. External data is where we go to whenever it comes to issues such as this. External data, what extra biblical, outside the Bible, there are books that are outside the Bible that tell us about the history and what was going on, uh, historical evidence is available to us. And so this is where we bring up a few of these uh, uh, options that we have. Mm -hmm. You might be able to want to deal with the archaeology one. You're the archaeology yeah. buff. Yeah, one of the greatest books in the world is coming out in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and it's like called Top Ten. Top Ten Biblical Discoveries in Archaeology. Who wrote it? Who's well, the author? Very what humbly, was the very humbly, I'm the author, and the occasion was you saying, "Dude, you got to write some posts on our blog." So, hey, so I wrote eleven. Background for it. And uh, yeah, so you can search uh, search uh, Amazon in a couple of weeks for Top Ten Biblical Discoveries in Archaeology. But then. Um, and then Bible. So that was just a promo for that, the book. It was, that was a it. shameless, yes. <laughs> I, I want you to talk about the actual, what is the value of archaeology oh, rather yeah. than about your book. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the value of archaeology is immense. And what it is, I mean, everybody's, so many people in the last 50 years have been able to dig down and discover amazing things that put a context to the Bible. And I actually have a book that I did not, that I did not write, but this is my favorite. It's the, you can tell because I have it duct tape to hold it together because I open it almost every morning, but it's the archeological. You dropped it. Yeah, and I dropped it, my dog ate it. But it's the archeological study Bible and it is full of archeological information. So if you're like, hey, how do I get this stuff? Whenever you, it's just a regular Bible, but then all the notes are related to archeology span and help put you in the historical context. Uh, Bible commentaries. You've got a Bible commentary down there called yeah. the Bible Background Commentary. Yeah. I recommend this all the time. I mean, there's two volumes to this. It's called the IVP 
Bible background commentary. I think it's the most accessible. This is something I, I honestly say, don't get any money for saying this, but I think every one of you should have this on your bookshelf. The both volumes, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why? Because if there's any relevant, really relevant Bible background, historical information, cultural information, like all we've talked about so far, that you need to know that is not accessible internally from the text, this will cover that. Like the head covering stuff. I mean, Michael is not that smart to think of that on his own. He got it. <laughs> you have to be smart intuitively. I was supposed to know that. Yeah, I, you're I smart, that. but not intuitively. Okay. Um, so I wasn't born with the knowledge, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. And so he got that out of this, basically, or something that's comparable. As reading the passage, so going to 1 Corinthians, opening it up on that verse, and then reading about, you know, why did Paul write that? Secondary background research that has to do with what's coming in here. Primary background research. You see, you see some of the um, books that we have up here, uh, the, the green and red and blue. Those are all external data, extra biblical data from people who live very close to the time of the apostles. Lots of stuff we can gain from that. That's actually how we get... Uh, why we know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John wrote the first Gospels. Mm -hmm. and, and just, uh, I brought this one up too. Uh, this is currently, I think, a, just a great, one of the best resources I, I would put a plug in for the ESV Study Bible. It's not going to give you specifically archaeological information or other things, but it's just going to be a general, give you some general knowledge and wisdom about the context and about other things as well. There are many good study Bibles, uh, but where a study Bible is good is that you're already le reading that passage and you just glance down the footnotes and it might give you a lot of that bottom left quadrant of help that you may be looking for and really need to understand the passage. Very good. Okay, a couple questions for you guys. A little bit of discussion. When you go into a different culture, into a different country, what are some of the customs that you need to be aware of? You're preparing for a mission trip to go to India. You're preparing for uh, a business trip that's going to be an extended stay in China. What are the things that you begin to ask and look for whenever you're going into that country? How to greet someone. How to greet someone. Yeah, we greet someone by shaking their hand. That's not a Don't universal do that. custom. <laughs> Sticking your hand out may be very offensive. Good. Language, for sure. I mean, just what language do they speak? What else? When visit, what do you do when you visit a home? Very what good. do you do whenever you visit a home? You have been on many mission trips or He's been a full stays stay. yeah, in Japan. Yeah. And so you, you understand this. Is okay. there differences whenever you go to a one home, uh, whenever you greet a home, whenever you visit a home in Japan? Yeah, definitely. And even when you move into a new neighborhood, mm. you have... Instead of the neighbors coming to visit you, you have to go around to each neighbor and give them a gift. So whenever you visit a new neighborhood, you have to go and give them gifts? Yeah. And you see clumsy Americans coming in like, well, howdy, you know, and oh my gosh, you're breaking every cultural norm. Do that again, do that again. Well, howdy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? Food. Food. Well, what kind of food do they have? And and what are your expectations? What kind of medicine do you need to bring to be able to get over the problems that are going to be arising? Do you wear shoes in their house? Do you wear shoes? I mean, custom after custom. What else? Do you tip when you go out for a Okay. Nice. Yeah, you might leave somebody, you know, 10 bucks, and they're like, what in the world? Somebody comes by and grabs it, you know, because there's <laughs> sit, money sitting there. Um, how about the way they drive? The way the streets are conducted? I mean, you know, anything from as basic as which side of the road do they drive on? You know, I mean, are there a left-hand side or a right-hand side? Uh, or do they care? Some of them just don't care. I mean, when I was in India, that was the craziest thing I've ever been through in my life, driving down those streets. Absolutely nuts. Mm -hmm. People walking across, people barely missing cars left and right. And I was like... What happens if somebody gets hit? I've never seen anything like this. They say, well, the people have the right of way. So it's the same thing as us, right? I was like, well, it doesn't matter. They're, they're going to get hit with the way they walk in front of the cars. The cars have to stop. I was like, I know that, but it doesn't make any sense. People don't seem to regard that. I say, what happens whenever they get hit? They say, well, what will happen if you get hit? If somebody hits somebody else in India, there will be a mob that comes and attacks your car turns it over and starts it on fire. 
<laughs> they said that's motivation enough for everybody to be careful. <laughs> Wow. Lots and lots of historical issues. What are the customs that are unique to us in our culture? What are some of the customs that are unique to here and now? Come on, basic. Doesn't have to be profound. New person moves in a neighborhood, you make cookies and take them over there. Nobody made cookies for us, though. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> Supposed to, though, right? What's interesting, though, is you made cookies for today. <laughs> and here's my answer. <laughs> uh, what else? Come on. I mean, basics. We, we eat breakfast, lunch, and what? Dinner. Okay. That's, that's a basic. As Ro in Romania, it was not like that whenever I was there. Which, are, which is our biggest, most hearty meal usually in America? Evening. Evening, which is not the custom in most places. Which I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Why do you need that much food to go to sleep? Yeah. Helps. Yeah. Lunch menu, $9.95. Dinner menu, $18. Come on, what's that about? Yeah. Well, and then also uh, we're very individualistic. Very I'd say individualistic. in 21st century America, where you give people their space, Try not to, you know, everybody's got their own agenda, everyone's busy, leave them to themselves unless if they want you into their world. Fast paced. What do you tell people whenever they're coming here from Japan? Listen, you got to be aware of this about Americans. Huge part of our culture going to church. 40% uh, of Americans every on a given Sunday are in church. Yeah. Something so you need to know. In Japan, it's less than 1%. So Less than 1% there. Uh, so how is this helping us Americans are loud, bridge the historical right? yeah. What's that? Sarcasm. Sarcasm, okay. yeah. We're loud. Some people would say arrogant, I mm -hmm. think. What does this help? How does this help? Well, whenever we're, when we're talking about this, all these questions that we just asked about other countries and about America, those are the questions you can't assume and place your own understanding of your own culture upon that and overlay it. Uh, upon other cultures in the Bible times. These are the types of questions that we have to ask in order to be faithful in interpreting, exegeting the passage of Scripture rather than reading into it our own understanding. So many times we just read into it our own understanding. Roy Zuck says this, when a missionary goes to a foreign land, he must know what the people in that culture think, believe, say, do, and make. He must understand their culture in order to comprehend them and thus communicate properly with them. If you have traveled to a foreign country, you have no doubt experienced to some degree the culture shock. This means that you were jolted by unfamiliar scenes and practices of people in that nation. When we go to the scripture, here it is. culture shock. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. We're entering into a foreign land. And, I mean, you see that whenever you ask someone to read through certain passages of the Old Testament, we don't even know how to interpret the names of the people, let alone know what they ate for dinner, let alone know, you know, did they watch TV? I mean, what was their world like in that time, let alone, I, there's no way I can even say their name. I mean, there is culture shock, and unfortunately, that makes people many times just stop reading the Bible, as opposed to saying, hey, I'm, I've got some culture shock, that's okay, I'm stepping into it because this is God's truth. All these issues, political issues. Whenever Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 13, Rome was under the rule of the Caesars. The Caesars were not only polytheistic, but uh, many of them were homosexuals. Just a one Caesar later, we're gonna have one of the Caesars who is gonna be marrying a boy. Paul, in that context, tells the Romans, all government authorities have been given by God and instituted by God. What an important thing that is to realize what was going on in that day whenever Paul was given that command and how hard things were from a political standpoint. Agricultural, um, another example here, uh, and, and geographical, this would cross over both of those, but whenever Israel came from, the, from Egypt to the Promised Land, you must understand the agricultural shock that they were getting. They were moving from Egypt, which was very stable in its economy very stable in its agriculture. Every year you can count on the Nile overflowing and, and fertilizing rich, rich fields and growing up and you would get all the crops that you need. 
You didn't really have to worry too much about rain and those sort of things. Very stable economy. God says, I want you to go from Egypt, stable economy, to Israel, which is probably about the most unsecure economy that you could find. I'm going to take you to the promised land, and it's a desert. And it's a desert. <laughs> Good luck with that. And, and <laughs> what, to, what you're going to have to do here is you're going to have to rely completely upon me to be able to bring in whatever it is that you need. Very unsecure, not only agriculturally, but militarily. It was a trade route. Well, I'm putting you right in the middle of a country that everybody's going to want forever. And, and there's going to be war from now on because by trade, by land, or by sea, everybody's going to want your country. That's the promised land. What does that teach us about God? Where he places us? Does he place us in points of comfort in our life and security? Or does he point us in places where you have no choice but to turn to him and continually be on your knees every day? That's what he did with the Israelites. How much does that add to our understanding of the mm -hmm. Exodus? Mm -hmm. um, social. It's very hard for us to look and see what Jesus did whenever he crossed through Samaria and goes and talks to the woman at the well. You know, we look at it and say, yeah, I mean, we, we, we don't... Uh, we as men don't refrain from talking to women. Yeah. It's I was not talking to Carrie, value. our coworker, the other day. Nice going. Yeah, very thanks. Very good, very good. Very humbling for you to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus goes in and talks to a woman. First of all, you don't talk to women, especially, especially in this day, culture, about religious things. And number two, more importantly, you don't talk to a Samaritan. You don't walk through Samaria. Those are, those are from their culture. They would be very prejudiced against Samaritans. Mm -hmm. They would call them half-breeds, half-Jews, and half-whatever, but they didn't like them. For Jesus to go in and talk to a Samaritan woman, that is very important cultural issue that you need to know whenever you're reading John chapter 4. I believe so. Um, geographical, I already talked about that. Legal, uh, another thing that's important is, is something that's that often gets brought up when we're talking about the resurrection event. Remember after the resurrection, who were the first to see Jesus risen from the grave? Women. Women. Now, why is that significant? Nothing to us in our culture. But to them, very significant because women's testimony was not legally permissible in a court of law. And so whenever they were the first to give their testimony, it is a black eye for the gospel of that day. It is an embarrassing moment for the women to be able to see the uh, risen Christ first. Why is that important? Well, it's important for our day because one of our historians looked back to see if something is historically correct, they will say, is there any embarrassing details? Because if it's, if it's not historical, people really won't put embarrassing details. They'll hide everything. You know, if they lost a war, they don't, don't, don't. We always Tell try and make that. ourselves look best yeah. in the eyes of history. And so whenever we have embarrassing details, normally whenever you tell an embarrassing detail, you come and confess something to me, I don't think you're lying if it's embarrassing, right? It's the factor of embarrassment. Very important for us to recognize that when we're talking about legal. The women seeing Christ first was an embarrassing detail, but for us, it's a historical marker that it was genuine. And having our, I think having our antenna tuned to this, I would say is very similar to if we don't care about any of these details, we aren't seeking to really understand the world that God gave us these truths from, it'd be like we would always be content with just listening to like a bad radio signal. You're still hearing those same words. It's a bad radio signal. But now as we dive in, it starts turning into this HD television picture where, where before I was, I was kind of content just to say, oh, look at Jesus you know, talking to this woman by the well and, and then keep reading. But now that I'm really seeking this historical and I'm realizing what's going on here, I'm realizing the significance of God allowing women to be the first ones to know that our Savior is risen, I'm, I'm, I'm more in awe and worshiping my God more passionately because he's giving me this clearer picture of, of just the, the amazement of all that he's done, where before I was more content just to have a surface level. Clothing. Um, lots of things to do with clothing in the Bible, but one thing that stands out is uh, like in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the rich man, it says, he, he was uh, uh, habitually dressed in purple and fine linen every day. 
Well, you'd say, okay, no big deal. You know, I, I dress in purple every other day, right? <laughs> uh, I don't personally, but uh, you guys might. Um, in that, what you're seeing, what you're missing is that purple was a royalty color, not simply because it was uh, a social issue, but because it was an economic issue. You, nobody could afford purple because it was taken from dye made from snails that nobody but kings could afford. And so whenever he says, this guy dressed in purple every day, he's saying this guy was so incredibly wealthy, you can't even imagine. He was a king every day. Important. Uh, philosophical culture. Whenever Acts chapter 17 occurs, Paul is going through the city of Athens. Paul is going through the city of Athens with the primary belief he wants them to grab a hold of is the resurrection of a bodily, of a risen Savior. The body of a guy got raised from the dead. Now, we wouldn't think anything of that, but in their culture, their philosophy was this. Body is evil, spirit is good. Once we die, good riddance. Bury that sucker, and we've escaped to the body. And we're going to be forever in spirit. That's the way they thought. The body was completely evil. Paul comes and preaches the resurrection. You remember in the, in the text it says, we want to hear more about this resurrection stuff. Because it was bizarre to them. Why in the world would somebody preach that God became body, flesh, and then died, escaped from that, and then sought to pick it back up? How bizarre it would have been in this world to preach the resurrection. Got to know those types of things. Very important. Enhances the text. Mm -hmm. Combat training. Uh, this time we're going to talk about the practical asegesis fallacy. We've already dealt with this a little bit, so we don't have to mm -hmm. spend too much time on this. But this is simply uh, sometimes called reader response. What does it mean to you? The process of conforming the text to your current circumstances, making it more relevant and applicable. Again, this skips the historical. It goes in complete reverse. And so you're starting with what does purple mean to you? Well, then, that's what it's going to mean in the text. What does it mean that Christ spoke to Samaritan or a woman? Well, it means nothing. You know, I spoke to a woman, too, so no big deal. That's where you start to go in the reverse direction. It's also the part where you start with your own circumstance. What do I need to hear from the text? What do I need this text to say to me? What are the troubles that I'm going through? What are the doubts that I'm having? What are the, what are the big decisions of my life that I have today? you're going to be able to find it. Folks, if you practice this methodology, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, by taking things out of context, you can find anything. The Bible will say exactly what you're wanting it to say because you're conforming it to yourself. You're going to say, with my profound driving to Oklahoma City illustration from last session, yeah. you're going to say, I need to know in this chapter if I should go to Oklahoma City or I not. I remember the Oklahoma City. Oh, well, it was so profound, it just blew your mind and you couldn't even remember it anymore. Okay. But with this idea that I'm going to, I need to know from this chapter in Genesis 14 if I should drive to Oklahoma City. Mm. So I am looking to Genesis 14 and it's going to tell me if I should go or not. And Genesis 14 may have nothing to do if you should ever drive anywhere, but that's what eisegesis is, is you're saying, I'm going to find this in this text somehow. Even if I have to count up all the letters, divide it by 12, add 6 to it, and then do whatever Bible code that I can, I'm going to find somewhere in here a message from God to tell me what I should do. Folks, here's the deal with this. If you're going to treat the Bible this way, and if it's a magic book, and if it can be irrelevant of the historical details of the day, and it's only relevant of you and what you need, you don't do it usually consciously. You're not thinking this. It's just the way it does it. But if you're going to do that, if this is the method you're using, don't bother using the Bible. You can use any book. If God is going to not respect what was written and why it was written, to whom it was written, the culture of the day, if he's not going to respect that in the Bible, he cannot respect it in any book. Get Moby Dick. Get Harry Potter. Use the ticker on the bottom of Fox News. Use the sign as you're driving down the street, the billboard sign. It doesn't matter. Take whatever you want out of context and use it that way. You see, the Bible is not meant to be used in such a way. Mm -hmm. Okay, field manual. A couple quick uh, illustrations. Matthew 8, 21 and 22. Notice here it says... 
And another of the disciples said to him, Lord, this is whatever Christ is going and, he, and he's calling people and it's going one mm -hmm. after another of people having their excuses why they can't follow him. And this one guy comes up to him and says, Lord, per permit me to go bury my father. And Jesus says, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Now that's kind of shocking, right? You're like, wow, that was kind of hardcore. While Jesus was hardcore many times, we need to be careful here. Because in the culture of the day, we need to understand what it meant to go bury your father. Whenever somebody said, I'm going to go bury my father, that didn't mean that he died that day or two days or three days beforehand like it does today. And we got to go do the funeral service and i got to speak at it and, and a sign of respect. What it meant was that my dad is within a few years of dying, maybe 10 years even sometimes, and there's a process in which I've got to inherit my land. I've got to inherit my my, my share. And so let me go bury my father meant let me wait for my father to die so that I could get my inheritance. And then I'll have the financial security to follow you. Yeah. So, so don't, you, you can take this the wrong way, can't you? If someone says, hey, should, are you going to go to the funeral next week of your dear friend? Well, you know, I was wondering that and I was reading the scripture and it said, let the dead bury their own dead. So I'm going so, to church instead. Yeah, or I'm just going to go back to work, you know. And it's yeah. like, oh my gosh, it's yeah. not the point at all. Uh, another one, Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 16, it says, To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God, says this, I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold, or cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot because you are lukewarm, neither, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What does that mean? Well, it looks like he's trying to get them to be on fire for God, right? That's the way we read it. If you're cold, man, I'm, I'm really cold towards God right now. That's our culture. What does that mean? It means you don't really have any passion for Him. I'm on fire for God right now. My passion is lit for God. Well, Christ is telling us here we need to be hot on fire for God. However, if we look at the, the, uh, uh, the, agricole, or the uh, geography of the land, what we'll see is there was, there was an aqueduct that ran far north all the way past Laodicea. Whenever it was in the north, the water would come through this aqueduct. It was the way they, they transported water of the day. Whenever it would come through this, and whenever it started, it was very, very cold. Whenever it got to Laodicea, it had just become kind of not cold, not hot. By the time it got down to Colossae, a little bit further down, it got hot again. So the Laodiceans were always complaining about their water and their and their in their area, you know, it was just kind of this funny thing uh, that they would they would talk about and say, you know, we got lukewarm water, you know, it's no good, it's good for nothing type thing. It's not good for being cold for drinking, not good for being hot for drinking, and this is what Christ is referring to. Whenever he says this, he says, you are completely dispassionate in any way. You have lost your passion for me. You used to be on fire. You used to be uh, uh, passionate towards me, but now you're apathetic. And a lot of times we as Christians get that way. We get lukewarm towards God. It's just kind of like, eh, yeah. But Christ says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth because it, it's just, it's not worth anything. Lukewarm water, you just, you take a drink and you're like, you know, it's no good. It's not worth anything. And that's what Christ is saying to dispassionate people. That's what this type of thing adds to the text. Plagues of Egypt, we would think, okay, what, what is going on here at these plagues? Why ten plagues? Why did God do the things that he did to the Egyptians? Well, if we understand the culture and the background, we can begin to understand that each one of the plagues was directed at a specific God. Whenever he uh, put the boils on, he was fighting against the goddess of healing. Mm -hmm. Whenever he sent the hail, set the god of the storms. Mm -hmm. This is uh, God's way of saying, watch me dismantle every one of these gods and set you up for me telling you I'm the only God, put no other God before me. How much more meaningful after these plagues was the first commandment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions, comments before we go into our next field up. Then take a break. This is going to be really applying, applying this. We're going to just continually be applying the $70,000 slide over and over again so that we get familiar with it and comfortable with it. Yeah, the process. Yeah. Just walking through the process over and over again. Okay, let's go through and let's talk about the second commandment. What is the second commandment? 
What's the second commandment? First commandment you, commandment, you shall have no other gods. What's the second commandment? You shall not make for yourself a carved image. No idols. No carved image. You shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above or on the earth under it. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing that I want to ask you guys, and this is the discussion we're going to get into for a little bit. We already have the situation where there is no other gods, right? That's commandment number one. Commandment number two is to create no idols. That's kind of weird. Don't I not have any idols if I don't have any other gods? We talk about idolatry. Idolatry to us sometimes means worshiping other gods. Well, is that commandment two, worshiping other gods, or commandment one, worshiping other gods? Yes. The first one, yeah. I mean, worshiping any other gods is already covered in the first commandment. This is why in Roman Catholicism, they combine commandment number one and commandment number two, and they mm. split commandment number ten into two. Mm. Because we know we've got to have ten commandments, because later on it does say ten, mm. but this one kind of is a little bit weird because we've already covered not worshiping any other gods. Therefore, from our own thinking today here in America, we say we've already covered idolatry. But which is so great about this process is because before this process, we wouldn't have asked that question of why is this being written, and then to say, well, wait a second, why is it being written in light of mm -hmm. the verse before it? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? So what is going on here? Let's, let's start with a different question, okay? We've already talked about last session, what is polytheism and why? Now I want to ask you the question, if you're a polytheist that has many gods, why do you want an idol? Why do you need idols? What's the purpose of creating a carved image out of a tree, out of stone, out of gold? Why do you, as a polytheist, have an idol? Somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you worship other gods, why don't you just worship them? Why do you need an idol? Why? Why did they get an answer? Come on. Focus, okay, you want to be able to focus on a particular, you want your God to be able, you want to see it, tangibility, what else? Mobility. Mobility, mm -hmm. why do you need it to be mobile? Well, if you're going to war, you want to take your idol, uh, the God of war with you. If you're going to war, you want to take your God of war with you. What is going to happen if you take your God of war with you in an idol form as opposed to leaving it? If you, if you leave it, he's not with you. Why isn't he with you? Well, he's in one place. He's stuck over there. You're like, hey, you know, you left me. What happens if he gets left? And what happens if he's not with you? You lose. Okay? So, you know what? L listen to this. Listen to this. Take the idol with you to war, you win. Accidentally leave it, oops. You lost. Who's in control of the war? Yeah. Who's in control of the idol? You. Who's in control of the war? You. you. Ultimately, what happens in idolatry or building idols has to do with an issue of control. If you have your idol with you, you are manipulating that God to do what it is that you want him to do. If you don't have this idol, he is not obligated to do anything. That's the world view of the day. That's the way of thinking. That's, that's why they had idols. That's why you needed it in your house. If you had the God of fertility with you, more than likely it will work better than if you don't have it with you. Um, if you have the God of rain with you, more than likely he's going to bring rain than if you don't have it with you what all these things were for, the temples and the idols and such. Yeah, it could also be used for intimidation, or just mm. like you have a flag, you're showing who you are. And, you know. Could it be used for intimidation? I'm sure it could. Yeah, I mean, after enemies, you say, hey, we got idols. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, remember that idol? Like, yeah. <laughs> that one last time, we got it again. Yeah. And if they think they forgot it, you see the worldview here that God is trying to change. Now, let's go back to the original question. Why the second commandment when we've already got the first? What is God really asking them to do, the Israelites, or not to do? Relinquish control. Relinquish control to who? God. What way might they not relinquish control to Yahweh, the God? 
the God of the Israelites. By building an idol of who? Of Yahweh himself. And so the issue here, we've already covered other gods. I know you don't have any other gods, God says. Because we've already covered that in commandment number one. But don't create an idol of me. Okay, so we've got that down. Don't create an idol of me. Does he just not like to be seen? Doesn't like to be placed in these little things? And it just makes him really irritated? Kind of like the head coverings? Or what is the deeper principle behind this? What is God actually saying? You can't contain me because that's the idol. But what, what's... You can't control me. You can't control. You can't contain. You can't control me. I am not going to be manipulated. That is what God is telling the Israelites. That's the principle. You shall not try to... I, I call this often the arm twisting commandment. Mm -hmm. You don't twist my arm. You're not in control. I am. Why does he use that phrase, likeness of what is in heaven? Why would they have a likeness of heaven? Well, what are they doing? Let's, let's do the scripture that uh, interprets scripture. Watch this. Watch this play out. God tells the Israelites that they are not to make a representation of him that is made from the creation so that they could trust in what they see, as did the e Egyptians. We, we, analogy, we do the analogy of Scripture, and we say, well, what is going on right while this commandment is being given? What's going on at the foot of the mountain while this commandment is being given? They're creating, They're creating an idol. Aaron, remember? Remember the Israelites come to Aaron, and they say, hey, Aaron, uh, we don't know what happened to this Moses character. So therefore, create for us an idol so that we might move on. First off, notice this, because this can be so important in the application. Moses is their idol. Moses is gone. We need a replacement. Aaron puts together all the jewelry, makes a calf. Whenever he dedicates it, what does he say in dedication? What is the inaugural address about this calf that he creates? Behold, O Israel, the what? God who delivered you from Egypt. The God who delivered you from Egypt. Because you guys need it before you moved on. You're scared to death if you don't have him in your control. Mm. That's the philosophy of the day. One of control. God says, you shall not make anything. No idol representation. But what is he really saying? You shall not attempt to control me in any way. Mm. What, does God like, not like to be controlled? Or is there other passages that conflict with this? No. Universally throughout scripture, on and on again. God I'm is God. Control. We are not. Daniel, who can hold back my hand and say to me, what have you done? Mm -hmm. Well, you could if he's an idol. And he put him in a box and say, bad, God. Not taking you anymore. So it may seem obvious, you know, that we can apply this to our lives, but, but what's great is just keeping this in mind. This is at the top. This is what we need to do is bring it up to the top and then to say, how really, and this is where it's contextualized to each individual, how do I do that? How do I become God? How do I say, God, you have to right now at this time do this because I want to be happy instead of just letting God be God. Timeless theological statement. God warns believers. Now notice, God warns, not past, believers, universal, not to misrepresent his holy transcendent nature in hopes of having more sight to our trust. Or I would just cross that out and put control. That's mm -hmm. the best way to put it. Yeah. More control. So now we ask the question, if we've gotten number one, number two, correct, what, how do we contextualize this for today? How do you commit idolatry today? And don't say that you don't have any idols. I know you don't have any idols, okay? Unless you're a Buddhist or something like that. I know that. But how can you violate commandment number two? What ways do we? Put it on your dashboard. What's that? Put what thing on your dashboard? Uh, it could be Jesus, it could be Mary. Well, it could, and I think a lot of Christians do have things hanging from their dashboard, you know, saints and stuff like that, that, that house supposedly the power of God a little bit. Wearing a cross. Wearing a cross. I mean, I, 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 I don't have my cross on right now, but I'm not saying there's anything wrong with wearing crosses, but I'm saying whenever you think the cross has some inherent power that will ward off demons, I remember when I was little, I got this cross when I was very little, born it all my life, but I used to wear it thinking, well, maybe just in case, you know, some evil spirit comes by mm -hmm. me, he will see the cross and run, because that is 
kind of the way the movies do things. Mm. Holy water, those types of things. What else? Security rings. Huh? Security rings? Security rings? Purity. Purity, purity rings. rings. Well, the purity ring can in the sense that this. I'm wearing this, therefore God loves me more. Therefore or, I'm blessed more. Or it'll protect me. This or ring protect will me, protect yeah. me and God will protect me through this ring. Whenever you see in the movies, people are, whenever in Rocky II, whatever Adrian is in the hospital about to die. Way to give a timely illustration. Everybody's in Rocky II. <laughs> in Rocky II, whenever Adrian's about to die, where does Rocky go to pray? The church. Why? Because God's there. And there's a, a, there's a megaphone more. in the church that just... <laughs> you may say, you know, I know that God's everywhere, but whenever I do go to the church, he's a little bit more present. I can twist his arm a little bit more. Now, I'm not saying you can't go to, they're not special places, you know, like on the outside, whenever you're outside and, and you're, you're looking up at space and, and you see the grandeur of God and you feel closer to him. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is whenever you have these little things that somehow twist the arm of God, he's a little bit more present. Um, all kinds of things that we could bring up with regards to this. People can be our own idol. That if I'm with pastor such and such, if he's praying for me, then God's arm is going to be twisted a little bit more. We need to be real careful. God is saying, listen, here's the deal. I'm in control. You can't say a magic formula prayer. You can't say it six times over and over again and it somehow be more effective. You can't tag in Jesus name to the end of a prayer and all of a sudden it sanctifies it in my power. I have to do what you have to say. I am in absolute control of all things. That's what God was telling the Israelites because you know what? You think you're in control. You think you're in control of your nation. I'm in control of the nations. I'm in control of your life. No one can hold back my hand and say, hey, I've got you in an idol you got to do what I want you to do. Important, I mean, second commandment, folks. Second commandment type stuff. If we're right and we've gone through this, how much does this change us from the very beginning about our view of God and his sovereignty? About like uh, holy water, rosary beads. Holy water, rosary beads, burying a St. Christ Christopher's in your backyard to sell your house, right? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Um, Bible background material here. I've already suggested these books. Uh, IVP, Manners and Customs, great book to have right there. Illustrated, there's a larger nine volume set. We actually have these for sale up here, um, uh, these different uh, Bible background commentaries. So if you guys wanted to leave here with some of these materials, that'd be great. Those of you who are watching this through DVD, you're going to have to get it from somewhere else. Uh, but uh, that, that'll aid you in your study. Questions, comments? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us uh, some insight in, in how we're to study your word. Thank you for the reminders. It's a different culture time, different language. It's come incumbent upon us to, to know that as we study it so that we get a proper understanding of what it is you're saying. It was a great time in the service to follow that you might be honored and glorified. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.